So Colin, where are we now? So we're in the Technology Exploration Lab. Um, so nicely branded up. Um, but this is a Sex Squared Extra facility. Um, this is the place where we get to kind of expose founders, startups, SMEs to new technology. Um, we often find solutions to problems um, and we don't look at what else might be able to solve those problems. And that's what this space is all about. This is, I just want to try something. Brilliant, can we have a tour? Of course you can have a tour. So the main premise of this room is um, that you can come in and use what we call a station. Mm -hmm. And the stations are kind of orientated around one particular technology. Um, and that we can also collaborate. So we've got some kind of 4K streaming and screen, video conferencing, as well as the ability just to sit around, obviously, post-pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so what that means is that when you're also trying these things, you can get other people in. You can get your peers. You can get people that you might be working on these projects, and they can comment and add um, and so on. You're not working in isolation. And just to reiterate, you don't just get let loose at these things, but you have somebody like yourself who will help with the technology and using the stations. Exactly. So it's a bit of a, um, it's a member facility to start off with, um, but we also do a lot of work um, outwards as well. So we kind of react to the community and we put on workshops and events that might help the community to, to kind of engage. From a member perspective, um, we, we can allow self-led use. Um, we induct, we get people, you know, all the health and safety and, and so on and so forth. Um, and they can just crack on with their projects. Um, Brilliant. So. so can you show us how to use some of the stuff? Of course we can. So as we move around, um, the first station, only a little station. So this is um, part of the 3D design um, station. So this is a chance for people to um, experiment with photogrammetry. Um, and we've got a 3D scanner here. The 3D scanner we've got is turntable based, or you pick this up, you put it on a tripod, you cover your item or whatever you're scanning with markers, and you can start to 3D scan anything that you want. Right, and I see Chris has left his watch there. Chris has left his watch there. So the point of photogrammetry is that you can do um, a few different things. One is reverse engineering. The idea of reverse engineering being that you might have a thing that you need to recreate. So what you do, quite simply, is you put your item on here. When it's turntable based, it's nice and easy. You open up the software, you do a bit of adjustment, and I'm terribly sorry, but I haven't done much adjustment, so it probably won't work very well. It's okay. Um, and quite simply, when you're ready, you start scanning. So how long does would like a smaller item like that usually take to scan? So a smaller item like this, we're not doing too many steps. Um, we're not doing it in fine detail, and we haven't really set it very heavily. It's probably only going to take about a minute. Okay. So we can watch that happen. And what you'll see on the screen is that as it turns around um, on, its, on the turntable, it's just building a picture of that side. What you do after the first iteration is you then move the object and do it again. And then it'll overlay and find it, the gaps it automatically. Will indeed, yeah. yeah, so oh, it'll perfect. overlay and find the gaps. Sometimes that's important, sometimes it doesn't matter to you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're doing solid objects, it tends to be less of an issue. Um, oh, that's brilliant. So, yeah, it's whirring away, it's on seven of 10. Mm -hmm. it's, strugg it's struggling a bit, but obviously we're here, we're in its light. It's moving a little bit, so you can, you know, oh, support yeah. things a bit. You can see the movement on there. So it, it takes a bit of playing, but the output that you can get from here is incredibly accurate. It's down to, you know, less, you know, milli, milli millimeters, if that's even a thing. Um, it goes below millimeters. Oh, wow. So, you know, it's incredibly accurate. What you can then do is you can export that and start working on it in any 3D package. So you can start to amend it build it, um, restore it. If it's not whole, you can start to create new things on it. So we did a, a little workshop in here, which was a really, really simple thing just to get the, the kind of people to understand the technology. We scanned in an item, we put their initials engraved on it, we printed it out. So they've got the same item, but now it's got their initials on it. So it just shows that you can amend, you can keep going. So yeah, what you see here is that we now have a not very well scanned, um, Chris's watch. So Chris, do you want that watch or do you, would you like that watch back? I think I'd like the original back. Okay. <laughs> Here you go. The other use case for this is that um, this becomes really important when you're working with things like built environments like AR and VR. So if you're um, scanning in real interfaces, if you're um, working on say an innovative project that mirrors the real world, mm. you can start to use photogrammetry to scan in the real world to make it accessible virtually. 
So a lot of virtual environments are, as I said, built. You build them in 3D model packages. And this is a chance to then overlay things as a skin. So the University of Exeter, and I can say this now because they've, um, they've released it publicly, they're doing a similar thing with Airbus, okay. um, where they are training pilots in virtual environments, but it's now a photorealistic virtual world. So it, it, it's, you know, and it's pretty limitless as to how detailed you can get in those, that field. Talking about virtual worlds, I've noticed these things, and I do know that those are VR sets. So you, <laughs> do you guys do VR and AR as well? We do indeed, yep. So we've got a couple here, and we've also got some others that are out with other people at the moment. So what we do with AR and VR is, is two things. The first is we allow development um, on AR and VR platforms, and we will talk about how we do that with a terminal in a second. The other thing is as well, we help people to understand release channels. So when you start a journey with development, it's really important to know what the end product's going to look like. So we take things like this. This is um, an HTC Vive Pro, uh, Focus, sorry, Pro. Now, the problem with things like this is, this is what your average consumer will end up using your software product on. But these are quite a cost for a startup to just you know, spend their cash on when actually it's not part of their development. It's just to, to make sure the user experience works. So the chance to develop here and then see if it works in the release channel that it's intended for, you know, is a really key thing, as well as using it for collaborative tools and yeah. so on and so forth. So you're basically bringing development and testing and QA closer together and just enabling that to be done in one step within one room. Exactly. Um, so the development happens over here. And we've very conveniently got the side off of this um, so that we can see inside. So this is a high-powered terminal. Um, the idea behind this is this is an asset that is definitely unaffordable for most people. Um, you know, the kind of computing power that we've got in here, we've just upgraded this um, to over 100 gig of RAM. Um, it's a Xeon Silver processor. Um, the barriers aren't just financial. Quite often they are the devices that they have. So they might be at home on a laptop and they start their project and they start a render and it says that's going to take 30 days. Um, you come in here, because of the advanced computing power, it's a day. Um, and what that means is that person is able to continue their development journey. So in essence, all we're really adding there is power. But then there's another layer over this, which is most of the pieces of software on here come with one, people like myself's help, but also we have links into most of these industry partners as well. So we've got representatives at SolidWorks, at Unity, at AutoCAD, all of these kind of places that if someone needs help and support, we can enroll them on a, a support program that we've agreed with them, mm -hmm. that they can then have access to that kind of industry help to really get them to the next level as well. And each one is different. Um, SolidWorks has an entrepreneurial program. Um, Unity has a, a kind of startup program. AWS has a startup program. So they're all slightly different, but we help them understand what elements of those are most appropriate for them at that time. So I can hear a lot of noise. Uh, what is so noisy here? Can you show me that? Because <laughs> he's, he's creating a storm, isn't he? He really is, he really is. And he's currently on layer 293 of 1,170. So still got a ways to go. Still got a way to go. So this is our large format SLA 3D printer. Mm -hmm. The SLA, and I always get this word wrong, stereolithography. Oh, there you go. So this is photopolymer resin. So this is liquid resin that is cured with a laser um, to create a 3D product. We do have our little mascot here. Oh, okay. Which is an error, um, which is why it's remained our mascot. Of course. So, um, what was it supposed to be? It's a human heart. Oh. Um, and it is a, a real, not a real human heart, but it is a map of a real human heart. Unfortunately, um, in the workshop that we did, we um, accidentally kept it with internal supports. So it looks a bit ugly inside. But what we've got here um, is the basis of what we can do here and the different types of materials. So this is a clear, um, slightly uncured, because we knew it was an error, but this is a clear photopolymer resin. We also have um, kind of all different types of colors. So we've got color base, you can actually match your color and add the pigmentation if you want. We've got your standard kind of resins, but then we've also got things like elastics, um, flexibles, um, high heat. So if you wanna make molds for other things, you can do that here as well. And the build plate, the reason why it's so big 
Um, the build plate on this is much, much bigger than you'll find on kind of domestic machines um, or even those small commercial machines, going up to nearly 30 centimeters wide. The thing it's doing is we have, with a client, we have worked together to create a, it's not even a prototype, it's a pre-prototype test. So essentially they are creating a device. Um, there's some structure around this device, but we're unsure about the human interaction with this device. Mm -hmm. in quite literally, how are people gonna hold it and so on. So we're creating a test which has all the different types of um, ideas that we've had. And we'll essentially, once it's finished, we're gonna pick it out, put it on a table and say, this works, this doesn't. And it's that kind of trial and error, which is at the core of everything that is entrepreneurialism. Mm -hmm. You know, if there is a famous quote, I can't remember who said it, but being an entrepreneur is exactly that. It is trying to do something new that is of value to someone else by the process of trial and error. Mm -hmm. And that's what things like this enable people to do. Brilliant. Well, that's great. So if we move on. Yes, we shall, <laughs> because now I know what the loud thing is. Yeah. So then we start to get into areas which can seem a little bit more niche. Um, but whenever we open them up to people, um, we talk about them. The, the cogs start whirring and they start to really kind of get quite excited. So we've got an electronic station. It's split into two areas. One is the manufacturing and one is the testing. Mm -hmm. What this gives people a chance to do is start to think about how their products integrate. So we're not manufacturing PCBs here, um, you know, but we do have links to people that can um, and we have advice and, and suppliers and so on. But what they're able to do here is start to integrate existing PCBs that maybe they've had worked up um, with say physical kit or other kits. So if you imagine the kind of hobbyist side would be an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi, you can do something similar, but you can surface mount your own components and you can start to build it into things like the casing and the things that you've made to be able to use the things that you've developed. So the whole idea is that this unit, if you were to create a finished product that contained electronic, 3D fabricated and software developed um, elements. It's all within here. And then a bit of testing, which although again, not lab laboratory um, environment testing, so it's not certified, it reduces the risk of people leaving this space with a product that doesn't work okay. um, or a product that won't pass certification. So this is basically to set them up for success yeah. in terms of getting a prototype that is good enough to go out and go to the next step, which is probably to try and find investment or to go to uh, bigger companies and, and try and just take that next step. Exactly, and you, the, you said the key words, and we do love them, it's good enough. Yeah. Um, because whenever you are moving to the next step as an entrepreneur, it just has to be good enough. Mm -hmm. no, one, no one is gonna fund you any different on a perfect product compared to that product that's good enough to convince them that it's right. And it's a validation piece, mm -hmm. you know, it's, I have thought of something, I have researched it, I have learned, I have gained support. I'm now going to see if it works. Mm -hmm. And to see if it works, I don't need it to do what I say it's going to need to do in the final spec. Um, I just need to see if it works. What we do here at Set Squared and in the lab and with the University of Exeter is we are not necessarily helping people to succeed. We're helping them not to fail. Mm -hmm. And failure is the biggest obstacle to a startup. Um, and when you look around places like this, if you can test an item before it goes out, you're not having to spend time and money to do that later when it fails. Mm. You're not having to reinvest time and effort when the investor says it's not good enough. You know, so that, that getting it to a good enough stage is reducing the risk of the next stage being a failure. This really reminds me actually of a dragon's den, just as a side note. <laughs> I love it when they come in and they have got no clue, they've not done their market research. And even the simplest questions by the dragons are literally flummoxing them. And they start, they start getting really, um, you know, overly invested and even yell at them. And I just think, actually, you should have come to a place like this, yeah. where you get the help to know how pitch works, know what to say, know your strap line, and have a prototype that is good enough. And those people have not come into an acceleration piece like this yeah. to actually be able to stand in front of investors. And we all know it's, it's also obviously televi television, so we know that there is an element of drama to it. But I think there is an element of... <laughs> 
there is an element of drama to it, but I think there's also an element of realism in it because so many people fail because they didn't have that space to try and the help that you guys provide here. So I think that's perfect. I think as well, we, um, you know, we're very, very positive and we don't like to talk about people in a negative way, but we can't avoid the fact that some people come to us quite a way down the line and they are already failing. Yeah. They are those people that you're yeah. talking about. So they do exist. So it does happen and accelerators like this, generally, we, even if the product or the innovation doesn't make it to market, doesn't have the traction that they say it is, the person that's been through the accelerator has come out a better entrepreneur. And, um, and we do have other phrases, we have lots of phrases, <laughs> but we do have other phrases. One of them, um, which may well be reiterated when you, um, when you interview uh, my line manager, Joe Pierce, um, which is we back the jockey, not the horse. Mm -hmm. Because that's the person that if we can teach them the building blocks of being an entrepreneur, if this thing doesn't work, the next thing might. And if that doesn't, the next thing might. So we're just giving them the best chance for them to be able to and do that. And the way we talk about that is that that's regional impact. Mm -hmm. You know, we obviously want our metrics to be hit. You know, we're here for a reason. We want people to succeed. But ultimately, it's all driven that if someone leaves us and then in three years' time starts a successful business based on the things that we help them learn, then that's benefited extra. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're aiming for. So the ROI is quite different. It's not about hitting all you know successful startups but it's about really the personal touch and this goes full circle when you told us about your actual why you do what you do and what your job is about it's a personal thing and yeah. the personal thing continues for as long as the per the person that you're working with is in the intra entrepreneurial space yes um if i was an entrepreneur and i'm not saying i'm not because maybe i've got a genius idea <laughs> um how would I get hold of you and how would I figure out how to get onto this program so I don't fail at Dragon's Den? Okay, so um, we do have many, many different starting points and it's quite a complex thing, but um, hopefully there's a bit for everyone. Mm -hmm. So Set Squared Exeter covers student entrepreneurship. So if you're a student or if you're still a student at Exeter or one of our other universities that we're partnered with as well, um, you should be able to seek advice from the student startup team you know, which is headed up by Emily Davies. Um, and that's a resource that all students have access to. That's the kind of precursor to this business acceleration outfit. For here, um, what we do is we hold your hand through working out if this is the right thing for you. Um, we don't just kind of embed you on a program. So I don't need all the answers before you I come You do not to need you. all the answers. Good to know. So, so we run as Set Squared Exeter. We have an Eventbrite page, you can look it up. We also, as the Technology Exploration Lab, have an Eventbrite page. And on there, you'll see our demo nights, our entrepreneurs programs, which is a kind of a quick fire three day, what's your idea? Do you think you're able to take it forward? As well as all the workshops and events that are run from here. Through those spaces, if you then become interested in using the space, we essentially, there's a few of us, there's our incubation manager, Ben Voisey, there's myself, Colin Dart. We're easy to find on the Set Squared Exeter website, which you can Google and you can just email us pick up the phone, and we will always be happy to talk about what your idea is. Yay. That was good. And I can do this. <laughs> oh, oh, why have you stopped oh. recording?